So I, I, I knew I would be able to sell it at some point to someone for some price, but I didn't know if these would be the people, if this would be the time. So it, it did feel like it was kind of a high pressure time and an exciting time too, but also stressful just is this is this gonna happen or not and kind of every phone call you have once you're in the negotiation process every phone call you're like is this gonna be the one where we close the deal is this gonna be the one where you know like I said they didn't bring up any big crazy surprise things but in every phone call I'm like maybe maybe they're gonna on this one this week on the channel, we're continuing our series looking at founders who've sold their companies. We had a video a few weeks back with Derek Reimer and a six-figure exit. And today I talk with Laura Roeder about her seven-figure exit selling Meet Edgar. Before we dive in, I wanted to thank our sponsor for this video, Quiet Light Brokerage. I'll talk more about them in a minute. I'm Laura Roeder. I'm the founder of Meet Edgar and Paperball. What was Meet Edgar and who was it built for? So Meet Edgar is a social media scheduling tool, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. And our target market was solopreneurs, freelancers, very small businesses. And what problem specifically did it solve for those people? So the problem Meet Edgar did and does solve is creating a library of content for your social media accounts and then the tool automatically repurposing it over and over again, which really means the problem it solves is fill up your social accounts with good, high quality content. And what were the price points and maybe the customer sizes or types? Yeah, so our price point was always around $50 a month, which I think is where it still is. Later, we added a lower tier for $29 a month. And our customer sizes were usually solo businesses, way less than five people. We didn't have a way to work with larger businesses or enterprise accounts or anything like that. And you decided to sell it, what, about a year and a half ago? What was the trigger that caused you to think, I want to sell this? Actually, the business had, the growth had flattened out and I was kind of dissatisfied with the business. And I considered a lot of different options of what to do with it. And what I ended up doing was kind of putting it in maintenance mode. So I let almost the entire team go. It was kind of running on its own. I did that for a few months. I thought that's the path I wanted to take. And then I didn't want to take that path. And actually that was kind of the impetus for selling the business. I thought I wanted to do the maintenance mode thing. It wasn't fun. I decided I would rather just sell it and that the math worked out better to sell it. What wasn't fun about the maintenance mode? I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, the building in the beginning is very exciting. That growth phase is very exciting. Uh, to have a business that you know isn't growing is just, it, it felt very frustrating. The idea was that I was just going to sort of accept that, you know, the cash was going to come in, but I wanted to be building and improving something. And can you give us an idea of where the business was at, maybe revenue wise, when you made this decision? Yeah, it was at a few million a year, top line recurring revenue. And so- you decide you don't want to do maintenance mode, you're going to sell it. What was the process like from there? Once I decided I wanted to sell the business, uh, the first thing I did was go into research mode. So the book that absolutely everyone must read is The Art of Selling Your Business by John Warlow. I also recommend uh, Before the Exit by Dan Andrews is another great book to get the lay of the land. So first I read those books and then I listened to as many episodes as I possibly could of the Built to Sell podcast. Thank you, John Warlow, for letting us all you know behind the scenes on on what real business sales look like i think both those steps are so important for anyone who wants to sell your business because it's a big new thing if you've never done it before there's a lot of stuff you don't know that you need to learn so that was kind of step one learn all the things after i had done that it became clear to me that the acquisition type that i was going to go after was going to be a financial acquisition rather than a strategic acquisition or sale in my case because we didn't really have any strategic interest already. It seems like when people sell their business strategically, they often have some partners or vendors or something in mind that they're thinking they'll probably work with. That just wasn't our case. We weren't, you know, getting all these emails saying we want to partner with you. Just 
wasn't didn't happen with Meet Edgar. So I thought, okay, so it's going to be a financial sale. And then I started thinking, do I want to use a broker? Do I want to use one of these websites to sell it? How do I want to do it? And so I thought, okay, well, I should start by researching who's buying, you know, relatively small SaaS businesses like mine. And basically by the time I'd done that research, I kind of realized, well, I have the list of potential acquirers, you know? I've done my research, I've found the companies that are out there saying, yes, this is our thing, we buy these kind of SaaS businesses, which are sometimes called micro PE firms, the type of firm that bought my business. And once I'd done all that, I kind of thought, well, if I already have my list of potential buyers, maybe I can just run this process myself. And I kind of figured, why not give it a shot? I was excited about doing it myself, so why not give it a shot, try to do it myself, if it was a total failure, I could go back to the drawing board and work with some sort of broker, m and advisor, whatever you want to call it. Did you have any concerns that doing it on your own, you might make a big mistake, like get a lot less than the business was worth? Sort of, but I felt like I was educated enough to have some idea of what the business was worth. Uh, before I started, I set a really clear number for what I would need out of the exit and I did have that maintenance mode to compare it to. So it's like, okay, I have this cash flowing business that's gonna pay me this much a month, this much a year. You know, I did estimates of the revenue going down over time, you know, when I thought it might kind of peter out entirely. So I had a pretty good idea of how much it was worth and I felt excited about doing the negotiation. It wasn't, it was definitely something new, but it was something that I was looking forward to diving into. And how did you decide on the price? So I set my own internal number that I actually tried to set kind of on the low side because uh, a big factor for me, which people don't often talk about is taxes. So in my situation and in a lot of people's situations, the taxes on selling a business were very significantly lower than the taxes of just collecting income for the business, like about half for selling the business. So that was actually a big factor in okay, what's going to be the number that if I sell the business post taxes is going to be likely kind of a higher number than I would collect just letting the business run out. And obviously also having that assurance of getting the cash in all up front. Once I have the cash, I can invest it, blah, blah, blah. So I tried to set my own extremely reasonable number, which I think is also kind of the opposite of what you hear a lot of people who want to sell their business and they're like, well, yeah, if someone writes me a check for 50 million, then sure. It's like, well, but no one's going to write. Your business isn't worth 50 million. So sorry, but that's not, that's not going to happen. So I tried to set a number that I'm like, I feel pretty confident that I'll be happy with this. I can get this. And then if I get more, then great. So what was the initial response? You send all these emails to these micro PE firms. Like, did most of them respond or only a handful? Most of them did respond. And I, I had a very targeted list of acquirers. And I think Something really important when you're selling your business is it's very important to hype yourself up about how great your business is. Because in this whole process, the other party is going to chip away at the value of your business. And let's be real, you want to sell it. You, you see some problems with it, right? And in, in one way or the other, right? Or else you would hold on to it. So, and it's our own business. We're always looking at the problems, how to make them better, blah, blah, blah. So I really hyped myself up, convinced myself on the value of this business. Again, nothing crazy, but it's like, okay, I have this number that I feel very confident that it's worth. And I was targeting companies that buy SaaS businesses. So, you know, it's not a super long list. So it, I, I think I had about like 10 kind of initial phone calls with people who are interested. And I think even at that stage, sometimes people get very intimidated being like, oh, I'm going to bother these people. It's like, these people buy SaaS companies. You're not bothering them. You're saying, hey, I have the thing that you want to buy. And so how long did it take to find a buyer and how long to actually close the deal? So it was all extremely fast. Um, so it took, I think, about two months from kind of first round of emails to um, the LOI that turned out to be the LOI. Uh, I sold my business to Shore Swift. All they do is buy SaaS companies. So by the time they bought my company, they had bought 40 SaaS companies and kudos to them, they had their process down. So they told me it would be a 30 day due diligence and it was. That's, uh, I think that's pretty rare. Well, no, I think a 30 day due diligence is extremely rare <laughs> from what, what I've heard about in other people's situations, but this was a nice thing about working with a company that this is just kind of all they did day in and day out. It was very formulaic for them. Also, our financials were 
so simple. 100% of our income came from Stripe. We didn't have any special deals. We didn't have people writing us checks. So it was a very simple business to vet financially. And what was involved in that 30-day due diligence process? Uh, so it was actually pretty simple. You know, I didn't need to hire a special accounting team or anything like that. There was no quote unquote forensic accounting where they're, you know, I've had friends whose acquisitions, they're bringing in Deloitte and stuff, even when it's totally ridiculous for the deal size. So uh, I had always done a good job with, you know, just the basic stats of the business and the bookkeeping and things like that. So those were the things So it's like, we want to look at all the bookkeeping. We want to look at the Stripe account. We want to look at the Google Analytics account, basically having firsthand access to make sure that all the numbers that I was saying were the real numbers in the business. Were there any surprises along the way? I think a big surprise for me uh, was how much I enjoyed the process, actually. Deal maker. <laughs> You're a deal maker. Heard, I had heard so many horror stories of it going terribly. And I had never done anything like this before. I was very positive and extremely cautious at the same time because a big thing I had learned from all the research I had done is that there are a lot of people out there that play a lot of games. So I was on very high alert for all these red flags for the games. Um, and I think SureSwift did an amazing job not playing games, but I was also very conscious in just sh shutting anything down right away. Like I didn't get into when they would kind of, a common thing in the negotiation, right, is they're gonna bring up negative points about your business and be like, oh, what about this? What about that? And the way I handled that was always to say, yeah, you guys need to make a decision if this makes sense for you. So if they're like, oh, I don't like this about the tech, you know, I'd be like, you know what? Or they say, we're gonna have to bring in this big tech team. Or we're gonna have to bring in the specialist. I'd be like, do the math, you know, if that's what you're gonna need to do, make sure the deal makes sense, make sure the price makes sense. I was never arguing about like, oh no, you won't need to do that or our tech's great. It was just like, okay, that's up to you. We both need to feel happy with the price and that's all there is at the end of the day. It's a really nice way to handle it. Really nice way. So from the time you signed the letter of intent, there's a 30 day due diligence. Did the, the offer or the deal change at all during that time? It did not change at all. And so again, I just have to give, I have to give them props because I hear a lot of stories um, where it does change. And something else I did is once I had the LOI from SureSwift, I could see other companies that they had purchased. Uh, so I called up some of those companies and asked them specifically that question. Did the price change from the LOI to the sale price? Um, and a few of them told me that it had not. I feel like I should throw in too while I'm talking about it. The team at ShoreSwift that I worked with has actually all left now and is now at a company called Big Band. So ShoreSwift, if you want to work with the people that I worked with, they're at a company called Big Band now. And throughout this whole process, what was the most stressful part of it for you? The most stressful part was probably just the uncertainty that the whole thing would work because it was it, it was a relatively short list like i said i had you know i had phone calls with like 10 different buyers um maybe none of them would just want a social media tool you know sometimes the stars just don't align so i i, I knew i would be able to sell it at some point to someone for some price but i didn't know if these would be the people if this would be the time so it, it did feel like it was kind of a high pressure time and an exciting time too, but also stressful. Just is this is this going to happen or not? And kind of every phone call you have once you're in the negotiation process, every phone call you're like, is this going to be the one where we close the deal? Is this going to be the one where you know, like I said, they didn't bring up any big crazy surprise things. But in every phone call, I'm like, maybe maybe they're gonna on this one. So the deal closes. You refresh your bank balance on your phone usually is what where people wind up doing it. But <laughs> yeah. you, you look at, at that number with all those zeros. Mm. What was the feeling that you felt in that moment? Well, it's funny, you know, the negotiation was way more exciting than the close because the close, I knew what was coming. I knew what the number was gonna be, right? I knew the day it was gonna land. So actually the negotiation was kind of the exciting part because that's when it was like, oh, are they gonna, you know, I'm asking for more. Are they gonna go for it? How much more are they gonna offer me? That was like, if there was an exciting part of the process, it was that. The truth is the number landing just felt like the end of this process that had already, for, for me, it wasn't a super long time that it had been going on, but just sort of, closing the book rather than like 
the, the big height of excitement. And what are you working on today? So today I'm working on Paperbell, which is another SaaS business. It's a tool for coaches, like life coaches and business coaches to do their scheduling and their payments and their client comms, kind of a, a back office tool for coaches. In a minute, we'll hear from Laura about the thing she bought with the proceeds from her sale. Before we do that, I want to thank Quiet Light Brokerage. They're our sponsor for this video. Quiet Light Brokerage has a stellar reputation, and they've been around for 15 years, representing founders and builders who make online businesses ranging from content sites to SaaS to e-commerce to WordPress plugins, and they have helped hundreds of founders exit their businesses and hundreds of people acquire businesses. If you've ever thought about selling your SaaS company, even if it's a bootstrapped company, even if you think, yeah, this isn't far enough along to require an M&A advisor, Quiet Light can be that partner for you. Head to microconf.com slash sell to learn more about Quiet Light and to get some resources to think through exiting your business. And now let's hear from Laura about the trophy she bought after selling Meet Edgar. So I had already started a house renovation when the deal happened. Uh, but I will say we do have Japanese toilets in every bathroom. <laughs> so nice. maybe my Japanese toilets are my trophy. So this is a new one. I've asked this question of a lot of people. <laughs> no, not one person has said they bought toilets. Well done. There you go. There you go. Something well you can enjoy every day. Yes, indeed. Well, congratulations <laughs> again on your success, Laura. Thank you. If you're interested in reading a full recap of the process Laura went through, she has a blog post titled Exactly How I Cold Emailed My Way to a Life-Changing Exit that she published about a year and a half ago. And we will link that up in the description. If you enjoyed Laura's story about selling Meet Edgar for seven figures, you'll want to check out this next video about how I grew Drip into a multi-million dollar business and exited for a life-changing amount to lead pages. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.